Facebook graph search privacy flaws, a student is disciplined for responsible disclosure, Mega is minute on security, and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act may get its first update in 25 years. Hello and welcome to ThreatWire, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. And this is your summary of what's threatening our security, privacy, and our beloved internet. And you know what? Let's begin with the three privacy settings that you must change before using Facebook's Graph Search. Now, Graph Search is a new tool by Facebook that allows you to search through your database of connections for interesting facts, like restaurants in San Francisco liked by all of my friends from Virginia, or music that my friends from Missouri like, etc. It'll use all that data that you've opted to fill in on your profile, including origins, employers, schools, etc. Friends and then friends of friends can already see all this info if they go to your profile, but if you don't want to be showing up in all these graph queries with your connected data, there are a few steps that you can take. See that little lock icon on the top right corner of your Facebook profile? Click on that and edit your who can look me up settings to friends only, activity log settings to remove tags, and limit past posts under the more settings dialog. Or you can just delete your Facebook like Darren does. Totally. Seriously, that's what's up. <laughs> now, 20-year-old Dawson College computer science student Hamad Al-Kabaz was expelled after disclosing a vulnerability that exposed personal information of more than a quarter million students in Quebec. Now, Al-Kabaz came across the vulnerability while writing a mobile application to give students easier access to their school accounts. And the vulnerability lies in the way that the system authenticates the user in the URL, just changing out the student number would provide you information such as their social insurance number. Now, in the spirit of responsible disclosure, Alcabaz immediately alerted the head of the information technology department over at uh, Dawson's College, and the IT director was really thankful at first, allowing Alcabaz to demonstrate the weakness in the software and even contact uh, the vendor, SkyTech, for a fix. So, so far so good, right? But the story doesn't end there. A few days later, Alcabaz ran a web application testing program against the vulnerability and in response got a phone call from the president of SkyTech accusing him of launching a cyber attack and threatening him with jail time. Now, Alcabaz signed an NDA with SkyTech and SkyTech didn't pursue, pursue any charges or report the matter to authorities, but the school wasn't so kind. Alcabaz was called into the dean's office and was called a threat with, quote, criminal and malicious intent. Dawson's College had 15 professors from the computer science department vote on whether to expel Alcabaz with 14 in favor. Now, Alcabaz wasn't able to attend or explain his side of the story. Like every time I was doing an interview, I was uh, letting them know what is my intentions. It was just to secure our data and uh, help uh, people uh, you know, use the uh, our, ser our the, the services that we're getting from Omnivox securely and you know with confidence. The story ends kind of bittersweet. Now Dawson's College gave Alcabaz all zeros for his classes with a note on his record of the unprofessional conduct. That said, the president of SkyTech came back around offering Al Alcabaz a uh, scholarship to finish his diploma and a part-time job in IT security. Well, at least he got those offers. That's pretty cool. Now, mega upload creator Kim.com has now opened a new cloud upload service called Mega. Yeah, no meta there. Offering 50 free gigs upon sign up. So that sounds pretty cool, right? But I wouldn't recommend backing up any sensitive data to the web service. First off, there is no password recovery. So make sure that you remember it and make sure you remember it good. And the encryption key to access your files is stored on their servers instead of your computer, meaning that the key can be accessed by anyone who gets into their database. The randomly generated key is made up using entropy, which is little bits of data that are created from your mouse movements or other unique input. But the JavaScript behind Mega's encryption is notorious for not being very good at collecting this data. This is a theoretical math weakness. In reality, the bit that you should be concerned about is the storage of the keys. Now, last but not least, according to Mega's terms of service, if the ones and the zeros of your files match another user's file, they'll only store one copy of that data. That sounds kind of scary. So if Mega comes under fire, fire from government agencies, do they actually have a way of telling what users are uploading, even though that they said they have no access? This means that they're using the same symmetric key for everyone's files, meaning your pirated copy of Spider-Man looks just like my pirated copy of Spider-Man. Not that I pirated copies of Spider-Man, maybe, I don't know, do you have any jokes about underwear in there? If I'm wearing a pair of Spider-Man <laughs> underwear and it looks just like your pair of underwear from Spider-Man, we're exactly. both wearing Spider-Man underwear. Hence why you don't want to upload those 
crazy photos. Or now, wear Spider-Man underwear. <laughs> or Spider-Man underwear. I won't go into all the gory details about file encryption and how it's done correctly, but take a look at the Ars Technica article for more information on that. In the wake of the suicide of hacker hero Aaron Schwartz, lawmakers have proposed an amendment to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Representative Zoe Lofgren has drafted a bill to help, quote, prevent what happened to Aaron from happening to other internet users. Most notably, the bill would exclude the terms of service from violations of this 1986 law. We're going to be keeping our eyes on the developments of this one. Ooh, that's going to be fun. Now, the week before last, we asked whose responsibility is it to secure your data online, the cloud service provider or you? Are local format preserving encryption techniques a good solution for the average consumer, or do you put your faith in the cloud? Our comment of the week comes from Malkut Safira, which sounds like it's from, it totally sounds like it's from Star Wars. I think the ultimate responsibility lies with the consumer. The problem is that the solutions can be daunting to those who are not tech savvy or educated. If the companies are going to continue to push more and more of their products onto the cloud and make less services available offline, that it is in their best interest to prioritize security or risk losing customers to those who do. Now this week, we'd like to know how you feel about responsible disclosure as it applies to the Lord of the Flies nature that is <laughs> academia. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen a story like what happened at Dawson College, so I ask, if you see something, should you say something? Hmm, should you? I'd probably keep it, keep it all to myself. Now remember, you can find all the ways to subscribe at ThreatWire.org and get involved with our Google Plus community. There's so much more than we can cover in six minutes here on YouTube, so that's where all the conversation continues all week. And with all of that, I'm Darren Kitchen. And I'm Shannon Morse. And Technolust, we trust. We'll see you on the internet. Aaron Schwartz, who co-authored RSS at the age of 14, he was also the designer of the code layer of the Creative Commons, one of the earliest architects of Creative Commons. Uh, he was also the founder of uh, Infogami, which later merged with uh, Reddit, and uh, the founder of Demand Progress, which in 2010 uh, was a huge campaign against internet censorship bills and was instrumental in blocking SOPA and PIPA legislation. 